My friend and I camped on his property in the middle of nowhere. It was in the area of Cane Creek, Kentucky, near Laurel Lake. There was no service, no noise, no anything but you and the woods. We set up our tent under an overhang and I was tasked with gathering the firewood. It was about 5 p.m. or so, and while collecting, I got this odd feeling, and then I started to hear whispers. They weren't saying anything I could make out. It was just murmurings. At that point, I got this creepy, odd feeling, and I moved closer to our camp to collect the firewood. I didn't want to stray very far after that. Night progresses and nothing out of the ordinary happens until we climb into our sleeping bags. I heard footsteps in the leaves and more murmuring. I was getting really freaked out, but I know the best thing to do is to ignore it and sleep. And so I did. The following morning, my friend and I found ourselves awake at 5 a.m. He asked me if I had heard whispering last night. I told him I heard it twice and we were both just as baffled as the other. We were not the first people to camp in this area. His uncle and his friends attempted to camp there as well, but they couldn't make it through the night either. My dad is a hunter, and he refuses to go down there to hunt anymore, as well as another friend I have. His dad says that the air down there is rich in death. I don't know the reason for what happens down there, but I won't be going back. from a small town in the middle of Denmark, and my grandfather used to live about 10 kilometers from us. He was what you would roughly translate as a nature caretaker. He lives at the place and gets paid to take care of it. The place that he lived was in a protected area in the forest, just where Denmark's biggest river meets a huge lake. The place had a lot of old buildings, an old paper factory, and a water mill. It used to be run by the monks of the Benedictine order. They built the mill to utilize the water stream to power the machines at the paper factory. The place is basically called the Monastery Mill. Most buildings are from the late 1500s to 1700s, but some of them are from 1100. All the way up until the 1800s, the place was run by the monks. On the other side of the river lived the nuns of the Benedictine order, who were said to have a bad relationship with the monks. No one really knows what started this feud. Firstly, it was small. Food would go missing from the monks' stock. Then the water mill would stop, and they would realize an insane amount of wood was blocking the water. Lastly, they would wake up to find cattle and chickens had been killed. And one night, the paper factory, which was built entirely of wood, was set on fire. Ever since that day, nobody had seen the monks. Everyone thought that they had left the mill to go somewhere else, as the order had many monasteries across the country. Well, four years ago, when I had just turned 18, my granddad was going hunting in Sweden. He asked me if I could take care of his place and his dogs for a couple of days, and since I didn't have a car yet, I would just sleep there and take the bus to school in the morning. The place is beautiful, and I was so excited to spend some time there. When I went to sleep the first night, I was woken up at exactly 12 o'clock by what sounded like a small church bell. It rang for a couple of minutes, and then it stopped. A small bell the monks used to use to call mass was just outside my granddad's house, so I assumed that's what I had heard. But when I woke up the next morning and checked out the bell, it was tied tightly, so no wind or person could have made that bell ring. The next night, it happened again. It woke me up at exactly midnight and rang for a couple of minutes. 
I slowly made my way to the front door, which was made of glass, to look at the bell. And there were my granddad's two dogs, looking out while growling. I swear when I looked out, I saw a bald man wearing a long white dress robe type thing disappearing into the woods, almost like he was floating. I called my dad sobbing and asked him to come and pick me up, and he did. We both went back the next day, checked on the bell, and it was still tied up. My dad then confided in me that even though he doesn't believe in that stuff, as he put it, he had had many weird experiences as a kid there, and he still couldn't find any explanation for most of them. Fast forward to last year. My granddad was still living there, and the council decided to split the river and make it wider. Had something to do with the forest environment. I didn't really exactly get why. It took weeks for them to plan it out. And then, the day came when all the machinery to start the expansion got kicked on. They only got to work for a couple of hours though, until they had to stop. Because as they were digging, they had found bones. Just a couple, no big deal. But what they soon realized was that by the river, on the monk's side, there was a mass grave. After specialists were called and weeks of digging commenced, they approximated that the grave had about 40 bodies in it, all from the 1800s. At that point, everyone realized that the monks had never left. What happened to them at that paper factory, though? No one knows. My wife and I seemed to have a simultaneous glitch a couple of years ago at a hotel in Canada. It's not the most significant or interesting glitch, I guess, but we've never experienced such a thing before or since. We were spending the night at a random hotel in Toronto on an overnight layover before flying to Mexico the next day. We are not from Canada and I had never been to Toronto before. My wife had, but as a teenager, and only on a brief trip. When we walked into the lobby to check in, there was a small line of people waiting at the desk. We got in line behind a middle-aged couple who looked like maybe they were there for a wedding or a party. They immediately turned around and smiled at us as if we were all old friends. The wife of the partner said, Hey, so are you girls heading back to Winnipeg in the morning? My wife and I faltered for a moment. She was obviously talking to us and not anybody else, but we had no idea why. We had never met this couple before, let alone engaged in any kind of conversation with them. We had just gotten to the hotel. Plus, neither of us have ever been to Winnipeg. Uh, no. I replied uncomfortably. The woman looked confused and just said, Oh. She was called up by one of the attendants and we got the other, so there was no way to talk any further. My wife and I just kind of looked at each other and laughed, like how weird. We got our room keys and went over to the elevator. It was a large chain hotel and our room was on one of the higher up floors. The elevator stopped before our floor, and when the doors slid open, there were about four to five guys there, late 30s, maybe early 40s, holding beers. They saw us and acted pleasantly surprised. They all did the, hey, kind of surprised cheer, as if they hadn't expected to run into us. My wife and I just figured they were having some fun. But then they started talking to us, as if they knew us too. Ah, we're having a party in Dan's room, one of the guys said. Again, my wife and I were unsure if they were actually speaking to us. 
but there was no one else in the elevator that they would be talking to, so they were. I said, oh, okay. Another guy said, you girls headed out to bed? My wife and I gave each other the side eye. Uh, yep, she said. Yeah, I'm pretty tired too. It's been a long day. The door slid open at what I was guessing was Dan's floor. Well, we'll all be down here in Dan's room if you change your minds. The guys got off the elevator, and when the doors closed, my wife and I started cracking up. What in the world was going on? Why did all these people seem to think they knew us? We made it to our room and got ready for bed. It was chilly, so I slept in my socks, which I almost never do. I fell asleep right away and I slept like a rock as we had already had a long first day of travel to make it to Toronto. When we woke up the next morning, I got out of bed and immediately noticed another weird thing. I was still wearing socks, but they weren't the socks I had worn to bed the night before. In fact, they weren't my socks at all. I was immediately grossed out, but my wife and I had a good laugh about it. I mean, how in the world did that happen? I've never been a sleepwalker, not once in my life. So weird. Since we had a flight to catch, we grabbed our stuff and made our way down to the lobby to check out. It was busy and there was another line at the desk. We stood behind this woman who had two suitcases. She was standing with her body half turned toward us, so she saw us coming. She looked up from her phone when we got in line and then went back to minding her own business as we were. Then after a minute, she looked up directly at us and said, did Bob go to get the car or something? What in the world? Again, we had never laid eyes on this woman before this moment. We had no idea who she was and we certainly didn't know Bob. I have no idea. I said finally. Like the others, she seemed confused by my confusion. It's been a couple of years since this incident at the hotel, but my wife and I still laugh about it from time to time. That hotel was just full of people who were so sure that they knew us, but that's impossible. Our theory is that maybe there was an event at the hotel with guests who looked like us. But I mean, what are the odds of that? And that still wouldn't explain what happened to my socks. To this day, it's still the strangest thing that has ever happened to us. I live on a 20 acre horse ranch in the panhandle of Florida, about a half hour from the Alabama border. And 15 minutes ago, I heard the strangest animal sound I've ever heard, if it was an animal. It happened almost right outside the property, which is only about 50 feet away from where I am now. It was a very loud whistle. I heard it four times spaced out by like 15 to 30 seconds, and each whistle was different, no repeating tunes or notes. It was loud enough to sound like it was echoing across the property. After the four independent whistled tunes, it was followed by a sound that almost sounded like a frustrated sigh, then nothing. Then the whole thing would start all over again. I sat there listening to this, like somebody was just facing the property outside the fence line, whistling four different tunes, huffing in frustration, and then doing it again. What's even stranger is that it was dead quiet while this was happening. Shortly after the silence, I could hear a pack of coyotes in the distance, which happens all the time. The owls over the lake, which is also frequent. But while this was happening, I didn't hear any of that. Also, to be clear, where the sound was coming from is an open field. It's so dark I can't see my hand in front of my face when I go out there. 
The weirdest thing is, we're more likely to hear gunshots than other people out here. The closest neighbors are like a half mile away in the other direction. This sound came from the road side of the property. The closest neighbors in that direction are over a mile away. We also have two donkeys on the property to ward off predators, and I didn't hear either of them warning the herd, which would mean that maybe it was a human I was hearing. But like I said, the property is fenced and gated, so they would have had to hop the fence. And whistling is a really weird thing to do when you're trespassing in an area where shooting is common. Update. It's now 30 minutes after the initial thing happened. I hear the horses running fast away from where the sound originated. Then, about a minute later, I hear their hooves heading back to where the sound originated. This happened several times. I am really confused. I live on a 13-acre property in the area of my state where the suburbs turn to rural farmland. My parents live in the main house near our road, while my fiancé and I converted one of the barns on the back half of the property into our house. Our house and another barn are set in a pretty wide clearing and pasture, but beyond that, we are surrounded by woods on three sides. All of this to say, we don't get many visitors out here. From the time we moved into the house almost a year ago, there have been some occasions where I get this inexplicable feeling of terror while outside at night. I've lived in the woods my whole life, including in places far more remote than here, but I have never had this feeling. The woods are my home. In every other place I've ever lived in them, they felt like my woods, but not here. I have repeatedly had the feeling that I am trespassing on someone else's land, someone who is not happy to have me here. The other night, I took my dog out for his last walk of the day. So it was pitch black outside of the ring of light cast by the floodlights on the side of the house. As I was walking toward the edge of the tree line, where my pup likes to do his business, I heard a sound, like someone imitating the hoot of an owl, coming from the direction of the other barn, about 30 yards away to our right. I was so certain that it was a human mimicking an owl that I called out, ha ha, very funny, dad. I assumed it was my father closing up the barn for the night, and he was taking an opportunity to try to spook me but no one called back. It was at that point that my dog lifted his head from sniffing all over and froze, staring in the direction of the barn. His hair stood up along his spine and he started to give a low, menacing growl. Now, this dog is obsessed with all people and animals. Everyone is a friend just waiting to be made. I've never seen him act aggressively toward anything, even other dogs that have tried to fight him. My dad, especially, is his favorite person on the planet, so there's no way he would have started growling at him. It was my turn for all the hair on my neck to stand up as a cold wave of fear hit me like a brick wall. My dog had stopped right at the edge of where the light met the darkness of the woods. Normally, the light gradually dissipated into the trees, still providing enough visibility to see the outline of trees and shrubs. But this time, it ended with a solid wall of black. Suddenly, I heard the same fake owl sound from only a few feet away, just on the other side of the darkness. My dog jumped and immediately started barking, putting himself between me and the sound. He's only a little guy, so I darted forward, scooped him up, and took off running toward the house. 
Behind me, I heard the sound again. But this time it had a strange warble to it. Almost like somebody was trying to mimic an owl while laughing. The next morning, when I went out to check on the barn, I found the doors had been partially broken off the slide and were swung past each other in the wrong direction, like someone had tried to force them open the wrong way. But there were no signs of anybody, not a footprint, not a cigarette butt, no signs of an intruder at all. I have no idea what was out there that night, but suffice to say, my dog and I stay well within the floodlights when we go out after dark now. My parents got divorced when I was 12, and my mom moved us into a small town in the Pennsylvania mountains. After a few months of living there, I went back to live with my dad in Texas. Ever since, though, I have heard the voices of people I know calling me into the woods. It's been almost eight years now. It's only when I'm alone, but every time I'm alone, and it seems to only happen in Texas. It's weird, but I never even considered that this was maybe something to be concerned about until recently. It was just something that happened. It was almost normal. I even followed the voice once and only thought it was kind of weird that I had heard my dad screaming at me when he hadn't actually called me at all because I got home later and I asked him about it. I don't know if this is related or not, but remembering this is what inspired me to tell this story. A few years ago, I was about a mile out into the woods in Pennsylvania when I kind of zoned out for a minute. I zoned back in and I heard a stick snap. I looked over to see a white tailed doe staring at me from about 10 feet away. It looked almost as though it had been trying to sneak closer to me when I looked at it. I just kind of backed away from it and went back down the mountain. If you're familiar with deer at all, you know this is very strange behavior. Usually, the deer are the ones that run. At the very least, they freeze, but they certainly don't try to sneak up on you. I'm not entirely sure what to make of this now, but looking back on all the times that I just sort of brushed off as normal, I'm starting to think maybe there was nothing normal about it. A friend and I booked a hotel room to ring in the new year. At the time of this event, I was completely sober. We were in the room and I called the front desk to ask about room service. They told me that there would be a rather loud party in the room below us this evening and offered to move us to another room. We accept this offer. They told us to get our keys ready so that we could swap them with the staff person who would deliver our new keys to our room in a few minutes. I start packing what little I had already unpacked and my friend hands me her key in the little paper holder. I pulled out my change purse and removed my key to put it in the holder with hers. This is when things got a little wonky. I can't exactly remember if I put the keys in my pocket of my sweatshirt or if I placed them down in front of the TV. But either way, when I came back from grabbing my travel bathroom bag in the bathroom, the keys were gone. I couldn't find them anywhere. The staff person arrived just a second after this. I go to answer the door to tell them that I seem to have misplaced our current keys and to please give me a minute, but I never do. I searched through everything in the two relatively small organized bags that I had, 
I searched all the pockets of my jacket, the floor, the bathroom, underneath the pillows. They were nowhere. I never left the room. These keys just vanished. From the time that I left the main room to go grab my bag and the time I came back, just a few seconds, those keys were gone. To this day, I have no explanation of what happened to those keys. We never did find them. In 2018, a group of friends from college and I decided to go and spend a month in Berlin over the summer. We spent our time between part-time jobs, partying, and just simply enjoying the city and its cultural activities. Everyone in the group was cycling places, but not me. We had a bit of a bike situation with mine, and so I decided to spend the rest of our time there on foot or using the metro. It wasn't that much of a bother until we decided to go and party near the River Spree. This place has bars and clubs and it's overall a great place to party. But from what I recall, public transportation didn't go that far in the middle of the night. They had all cycled there. So I was the only one without a means to go back to our apartment. It was a 20 minute cycle from the bar, but it was at least a 35 minute walk. A friend of mine, I'll call her Ava, decided to walk back with me and just take her bike next to her so that she wouldn't leave me alone wandering around the city in the middle of the night. It was about 4 a.m. by the time we left. As we're walking down this rather big street and chatting, I remember smelling food and seeing this restaurant past the pedestrian crossing to which we were headed. I'm a foodie and I was rather hungry, so that was pretty appealing. A woman was sitting there having some kind of food. She had black hair. I could see her profile through the large windows, which took up almost the entire wall up to the ceiling. I specifically remember thinking, that's weird that they're still open at this time of night. I remember telling myself I had to tell Ava about it when the flow of conversation allowed it. As I was walking and starting to cross the road, the crossing in front of the restaurant, things got kind of blank. It's like I was on autopilot. I was hearing her voice, but it was kind of muffled. Once we were past this restaurant, Ava stopped, turned to me and said, wait, wasn't there a restaurant just there with a woman eating? I had completely forgotten to tell her. It's like my memory had been wiped and restored within seconds. And there it was, a hotel. The large windows were the same and inside was the hotel's restaurant with a layout and tables that looked nothing like what we saw and nobody was sitting there eating. We were both very shocked and saw that a male receptionist with short hair was in there I knew we just had to ask him if somebody had just been eating there. It was just too weird. He was a little bit freaked out about us coming in like that, but he said he'd been alone in there for hours. After discussing with Ava, we found out that she also saw the woman eating, but she only saw her back. She was seated with her back to the window. While I could tell everything about this woman, because I saw her entire profile, after that, Ava never wanted to talk about it again. She got mad whenever I tried to bring it up. People seem to have changed around me after this event too. Even my mom started to not remember things that she should have remembered. And a lot of people just seemed different overall. I must also note that I was not drunk, not by a long shot. And staying up that late was really common for me at the time so I didn't feel sleep deprived either. Also, Ava saw the same thing I did. Interestingly enough, the name of the hotel that was originally a restaurant when we saw it is the Grimm Hotel, in reference to the author of many fairy tale stories. 
all in all, a very weird experience. Back in the summer of 2020, I was traveling with my partner to Boise, Idaho from Colorado to visit his family and stay for a camping trip. This trek is nearly 15 hours long, and while you can do it in a day, it's better if you stop to rest. Having lived in Utah at one point in time, I was very eager to show him the natural hot springs in Spanish Fork. They're located deep in Diamond Fork Canyon and require a 45 minute hike from the parking lot. Still, we were both excited to get out and get moving after seven hours in the car. When we arrived at the first parking lot, however, the gate was shut and locked tight. A sign taped to the metal read, closed, absolutely no access to hot springs, fines $2,000 max or something to that effect. We were bummed. The virus had shut down many things, and we figured that this was outside, so there's no way they were going to close it. After some research on the government website, we discovered that a body had possibly been found in the hot springs, and was likely the cause for the locked gate. Sad and tired of sitting in the car, we drove back down the canyon road to find a spot to camp for the night. Most of the more established campsites were closed due to the virus or were already taken for the night. This was fine since we prefer more dispersed camping anyway. So we picked a random road to turn on as we drove closer to exiting the canyon. Road 338. Most of the road was a well-kept dirt road. We passed some promising spots near a creek and maybe two or three other people were already set up for the night. We wanted to go a little farther to see if there was anything with that wow factor. Sounds funny, but some sites just give off that this is the one feeling. Finally, we came to a dead end in the main road with a fire mitigation road to the right. At this very spot, there was a strange boulder with some type of inscription on it. I had to investigate. The inscription read, Diamond Battle, June 20th, 1866. No way! A memorial for a battle that happened right here. A feeling of uneasiness and, oddly, respect washed over me. After traveling up the fire road and not finding what we were hoping for in a campsite, we decided to pick a spot by the small creek we passed on the way in. It was getting dark quickly, but we set up our tent in no time at all and got a fire going. The creek was loud, but peaceful. Though, ever since I read that inscription, I couldn't shake this strange feeling. I'm not a paranoid person, but I kept feeling on the edge of my seat, like something was watching us from the woods just across the water. As the night grew darker, this feeling grew stronger. I decided I didn't want to be in the open anymore, and I retreated to the tent to get some rest while my partner stayed up to enjoy the fire. I snuggled into our sleeping bag and exhaled comfortably, listening to the creek that was now much quieter and was a bit farther from the tent. I started to drift off when I heard it. Soft chanting, rhythmic drums. My eyes shot open. Was I really hearing that? I strained my ears to listen over the running water. I couldn't quite get a clear sound, but it was definitely there. This is when I noticed the ground was also rumbling, as if horses were stampeding down the road a hundred feet from our sight. I didn't know if I should get out to tell my partner or not, but I had the strange feeling that if I said it out loud, it would make it more true and that an army of spirits would spring from the trees and into our campsite or something. Before I could make the decision, I was dead asleep. This was somehow the most peaceful slumber I had ever had. The next morning, we packed up our tent 
and left no trace that we had ever spent the night by Little Diamond Creek. When I finally entered cell service, I did a Google search of that memorial and Diamond Fork, Utah. It turns out there was a battle there between the Utes and the Mormon militia, and lives were lost on that mountainside. After reading this, I decided to tell my partner what I heard last night before falling asleep. I told him about the chanting and the drumming and even the stomping of horses. He looked at me in total disbelief and said, I heard the same thing. I guess I was only in the tent for about 10 minutes before he got spooked, standing alone by the fire, hearing this distant chanting and drums. He came into the tent and experienced that same peaceful sleep that I had. I feel as though we were being watched over by some of the Native Americans that lost their lives there. A strong but calm and protective presence was there. If you're ever on Diamond Fork Road, I hope you visit and pay respects to the memorial of the Diamond Battle, and maybe the spirits of the land will watch over you, too. One night a long time ago in the mid 80s, I was riding around my hometown at about 10 p.m. with three other friends. Berkeley County, South Carolina was really country back in the day, so driving around at night on dirt roads is one of the things kids did to have some fun. The place we were driving to was called the Gravel Hill Light. It was down a long dirt road in the middle of the Francis Marion National Forest. There were no street lights of any kind and no houses for miles. Up until that point, I had seen the light a few times and even to this day, nobody knows what it is. I know it's so bright that it's almost like a welder's torch, but about a hundred times bigger. There's no sound at all and it disappears as soon as it appears. Anyway, this night we were on our way to see the light. We would usually park our car where the dirt road divides into another road, and after 10 or 15 minutes, the light would appear. We were driving and we hadn't even made it halfway yet to the place where the road divides, when we saw in the distance a red glowing light with fog and the outline of a body standing way down in the middle of the road. We had to drive slow, like 25 miles an hour, because of all the potholes in the road. We were curious, and we all said, what's that, at the same time? Then the glow turned off for about two seconds and came back on. This time, there were three to four figures standing in front of the red glow and this time they seemed to be about 50 feet closer to us than before. They were in contorted positions, but not moving at all. The light went off again, and two seconds later, it came on. Again, they were much closer to us, and this time there were about 10 figures silhouetted against this light, all standing in weird positions. I began screaming, Turn the car around, now, I mean now. Everybody in the car quickly agreed to turn around and get out of there, which is exactly what we did. Back then, I always thought of the figure standing there as ghosts, but nowadays, I'm thinking more alien than ghosts. At 18 years old in the 80s, it just never occurred to me that it could have been alien, but now, it makes so much more sense. My friends and I really haven't talked about this since it happened. My family has been staying in Cripple Creek, Colorado on vacation. Prior to coming here, we had no idea that there was supposedly paranormal activity. 
So today my fiance and I decided to take a stroll through town, taking photos and whatnot. We heard this weird static noise that almost sounded like it was coming from a loud radio pretty far away. It would come almost in waves, where you would hear it for a couple of seconds, and then it would just stop. This continued until we reached the casinos. Fast forward to tonight, we're laying in bed, listening to a video. And I hear what sounds like a scratching noise on the window for the second night in a row. I paused the video and listened for a few minutes. After not hearing anything, I continued the video. About an hour and a half later, I was almost between a sleep and awake state, but I couldn't really fall asleep for whatever reason. Then all of a sudden, I hear a scratch again that instantly woke me up. I sat there and listened. I heard it again. I yelled, hey, loudly, and I ran outside with a flashlight, but I didn't see anything. No person, no signs of somebody trying to get through the screen, nothing. After this happened, I was pretty startled and I am by no means one that believes in the paranormal. But kind of jokingly, I said, what if it was a skinwalker? But later this led me to do some research on the town and apparently it is filled with all things paranormal. I've seen several things about the casinos, the jail, but has anyone else experienced anything at one of the homes here? I'm really curious. My family owns a factory in the north of England. The building is 1890s as far as I can tell, and was built as a large shed for boilers that provided steam to power the steam engines in the big mill next door. The mill has since been demolished. It has a large water tank underneath it and a system to collect rainwater. The roof is made with cast iron trestles that incorporate internal gutters. It's fascinating. My brother is convinced that the place is haunted. Stuff apparently moves around on its own, and voices have been heard in the factory from the office when the factory was empty. We had an old bloke working for us a few years back who swears he saw the ghost of a man on several occasions. He did used to secretly drink several cans of John Smith's bitter whilst on shift though, so who knows. But he's not the only one. So far, I haven't experienced anything. But if I do, I'll be sure to let you know. This is a description of events that happened to me during my time as a security guard at a local factory. Obviously, I can't give any locations or names, but I will say that it happened in Germany. I have been working at this place for about two years. It's an old chemical factory that was built in the early 1900s before World War I. I don't know much more about its history other than that, though. For the first few months, all went pretty smoothly, but after a while, I started noticing some things that were quite odd. The first thing I noticed on my nightly rounds was that in some buildings, the lights seemed to turn on or off on their own. But I wrote that off as the old electrical installations, which could act quirky sometimes, or employees forgetting to turn the light off. Employees could act quirky too. The thing is, that stuff kept happening, even when there was nobody else but me on the premises. I could check a building at the start of my round, only to return 30 minutes later, to find every light in the building turned on, but the doors still locked. 
There was one particular building that constantly gave me the creeps. A flat, one-story building that was basically one long hallway with office rooms on either side. Every time I walked through that hallway to check if all the offices were locked, I felt like somebody was just behind me, looking over my shoulder. It was also in this building that I heard whispers or sighs from one of the offices, but they were always empty, and all of the electronic equipment that could have caused those noises were turned off or in some cases unplugged. Another building that I had weird stuff happen in was the metal workshop. The weirdest thing was that one night I heard a noise from within and when I entered all of the machines, the drills, the saws, everything were on and running. I just ran in, hit the main emergency switch and got out of there. That night, again, I was the only one there. I tried to talk with some of my colleagues about it, but they said that if I wanted to keep my job, I'd better stop talking about these things, as management didn't take too kindly to people asking questions. So, I haven't asked any more questions, but I definitely have some. This is an experience I had a few years ago, which made me a believer in the paranormal. I hope you find it as interesting and creepy as I did. I went out very early in the morning, about 5 a.m., to take photos in the forest. I've always liked the vibe of the forest, especially during early mornings, since it has a kind of calmness to it. I live in central Sweden, where we have many deep forests everywhere. Much of it is untouched. Think plenty of moss and old growth trees. This particular forest I went to was quite near my home. However, since I lived in the countryside, I was very alone with no other soul around. During this morning, there was also fog lingering in the treetops from the surrounding rivers which looked really cool to be honest, so I was very ready to go take some awesome photos. I went into the forest after parking my car along the road that went beside it, and I started walking straight in. After maybe a hundred meters, I stopped to take some photos, mostly of dead trees and mushrooms and things like that. I was 20 and I felt very artsy. After a few minutes, I started hearing knocks on the trees. Probably a bird, I thought, since we do have woodpeckers around here. So I didn't think that the sound was too unusual. The strange thing is that I started looking for it since it came from a tree that was right beside me, but I couldn't find it. Unlucky, I thought. I wanted to see if I could get a nice photo of the bird, but I decided to move on. I continued walking into the forest when I noticed something. The knocking or pecking seemed to follow me as I walked. It continuously knocked on the trees closest to me. At this point, I still didn't think too much about it, but that would change after a while. I stopped at a spot that looked really nice to set up my camera on a tripod in an attempt to maybe snap some cool photos of the surrounding area and treetops. I sat down and continued to hear this knocking on a tree just a few meters behind me. At this point, I started to feel a little weird about it, since I had started to notice how it followed me. A few seconds later, while changing my camera settings, I suddenly heard several very loud and very clear heavy footsteps behind me that rapidly approached until they were right behind me. My whole body froze. I have not until this day experienced chills like that through my whole entire body. After what felt like several seconds, 
I flew up and spun around to what I thought was going to be some kind of a big animal, but nothing was there. For context, besides a few trees, this area was not particularly dense. Just a few trees here and there, but mostly moss and grass, like a clearing. I picked up all my things and started walking quickly back toward my car. And that's when the knocking started again. It followed me again, and I just knew that something was mocking me. Feeling a little silly, I said, I'm leaving, okay? I knew that whatever it was didn't want me there. I continued to hear the knocking until I came back to the spot where I first started hearing it. And then it just stopped. I, on the other hand, did not. I went straight back to my car and I went home. Before this, I was pretty skeptical about the paranormal, but this really changed my views. Since then, I've only had one other experience that I consider paranormal, but this is the one that scared me the most. A little background. I am from Glenmore, Banyawangi, Indonesia. I work at a busy chemicals and perfumes factory for laundry. The place is on a narrow street between large farm fields and oil refineries. Since my home is a long way, I sleep in the factory bunks. This is where I encountered a lot of paranormal things. First, I remember it was a sunny and very hot afternoon. There was nobody in the factory because it was a holiday. I was the only one there because I had to check machinery routinely to make sure everything was in order. Suddenly, I heard a very loud bang, like somebody had punched the tables in front of me. And when I looked, there was a white smoke emerging from it, almost like a vape smoke, but much thicker and denser. It disappeared after that. It wasn't from chemicals or any of the other things going on in the factory. It was very strange. It almost looked like the smoke was aware of my presence. Second, one time I was trying to sleep and I couldn't close my eyes, even though I felt very sleepy. I just couldn't close them. It was like I was waiting for something to show up and eventually something started to. I can only sleep like 2 to 3 p.m. And all the while, almost every time, there's this shadow-like figure. It flies through the machines, or it will crawl beside the bed. I feel afraid, but there's nothing I can do about it. My body freezes still every time that I try to stand to watch it. It's a terrifying experience and it happened every single time that I would try to sleep there. Third, this happened like a month ago. It was raining on a Sunday night. I was still inside the factory, waiting until the rain stopped. I walked into the kitchen to make myself some coffee, and that's when I heard a whispering voice inside the women's bathroom. I know that it's only me in there, and everyone else has gone home but it's very clearly a voice, just humming. It was raspy though. It almost sounded like a woman in pain, humming to soothe herself. The next second it was whispering some kind of words that I couldn't understand. My body got really cold and I started to shake. I wanted to run, but I couldn't. It was like something was holding my feet tightly. The whisper became louder. My eyes actually started tearing up. I kept thinking, I can't handle this. I just want to cry. But I couldn't even do that. Finally, after 20 or 30 seconds of this, I broke the hold and got out of there. I didn't care if it was raining. It was better than being in there. 
A lot of other things have happened at that factory, but those three were the scariest. I want to quit, but it has a decent salary, and so ultimately I stayed. And I still do. I still work there, and I still have to spend the night there sometimes too. Things keep happening, but so far, nothing as scary as all of those things. But I'm sure it's only a matter of time. A former co-worker is back from the dead. This is one of the biggest personal glitches I have ever had. I work in the admitting department of my local hospital. One of the things I do is keep track of obituaries. When someone's obituary appears in the newspaper, I check to see if they still owe the hospital money. If they do, I clip the obit, fill out a form, and then keep track of how their insurance pays and things like that. A few years ago, and I've worked there for over 20 years, one of my co-workers in the dietary department retired and passed away soon after. I know because I processed her obituary. This co-worker's daughter was really good friends with my cousin, so the daughter was even over at my cousin's house the day after my co-worker's funeral. They had a big wake for her mother and everything. Today, as I'm working ER registration, the daughter comes in and says that her mom is in the ER. I was brought up a little short. I thought, uh, what? I didn't say anything for a moment, so my office mate had to step in for me and look up this lady's mother. Sure as heck, it's the woman who died years ago. My office mate lets the daughter back into the ER to see her mom, and I am unable to find the obit form that I filled out. Edit number one. I heard back from my cousin and he's as weirded out as I am. Coworker's daughter has no memory of the wake or anything, but she said she's been getting this stuff from the people around her for the past few days. People remember her mom dying, even funeral details and the like, but the coworker's daughter doesn't remember any of it. Plus her mom is right there, really freaky. Edit number two. Spoke with cousin instead of texting him. Coworker's daughter said that it was her dad that died and not her mom, but she also said that's not the way that any of the people who run into her remember it. They're asking where her dad is, how he is today. He's not answering his phone or texts. To her, the man had been dead for over 10 years. Edit number three. I've been asked if I had any close calls or moments where I could have slipped from one universe to another. And yes, there was one. It was a little over two years ago. I was getting my evening medications together, but I was tired and I screwed them up. I ended up taking an entire full bottle of glipizide, which is a medication that lowers your blood sugar. I accidentally took enough to kill a horse. I realized it right as I laid down for a nap due to extreme exhaustion. And I felt really, really weird going to sleep. Looking back on it, Maybe I fell asleep forever there and woke up here. Final edit. I've been getting a lot of angry replies about what happened with the glipizide. So this is the full story. I take a lot of medications for a lot of stuff. So I have a lot of empty pill bottles lying around. That day, I had an empty pill bottle with the label still on it. So I figured I would just grab all of my evening med doses out of my bedroom take them to the dining room, and just swallow them with dinner. I've done it loads of times before. Like I said, I was tired that night. So when I pulled out my bottle of glipizide, I got my dose, and then accidentally closed the bottle with my evening meds in it, put it back where the bottle of glipizide went, and then took the full bottle of glipizide with me to the dining room. I wasn't paying attention. I didn't look at the bottle when I took my meds that evening. I just threw the pills back and swallowed them with dinner. The pills were tiny and all I noticed was that they didn't feel quite right in my mouth. I didn't think anything else about it though because the idea of taking a whole bottle of pills seemed ludicrous to me. 
I mean, what kind of idiot would do something like that? Me, apparently. When I stumbled back to my bedroom, I checked the bottles, because something was very, very wrong. I discovered the rest of what should have been my evening meds in the bottle. I had mistakenly put the glipizide in its place, and that's when I saw that I had downed the full bottle. I wanted to grab my husband and holler and shout, but my body was made of lead. I could only crawl over to my bed and flop on it. And when I woke up, everything was fine. That's what I mean by going to sleep there and waking up here. I don't think that I woke up back in that place, that other dimension. I think I died there and I woke up in this one. I tell that story because that's why I think that perhaps, just maybe, that person did die in the other universe, but not in this one. In any case, it's freaked me out ever since. I know this story is going to sound weird and crazy, but hear me out. I'm not too familiar with this subreddit, but a friend of mine who's always talking about metaphysics, the twilight zone, simulation type stuff, loves this sub and keeps telling me to post my story. Anyway, here's my story. Two weeks ago, I was about to get ready for a party at six. Just before I started getting ready, one of my friends messaged me super excited because a guy she's had a crush on for the last four years finally asked her out and he was coming to the party with her while i was texting her back my younger brother walked into the room and asked if i could drive him to his friend's house which i agreed to do then i went into the bathroom to have a shower and do my makeup so i got in the shower but when i went to wash my hair i realized that my conditioner was finished I was pretty ticked off because I had only bought it a couple of days beforehand, and it's an expensive brand. My younger sister always uses up my things, so I knew that she had used it all. She had also trashed the bathroom, leaving water everywhere and her dirty towel on the floor. I was pissed off, and I was about to get out of the shower in order to tell her off and get some more conditioner. But as I went to get out, I realized at the last second that she'd kicked the grippy mat that we have at the bottom of our shower tub up. Our shower and tub is super slippery without the grip mat. So as I went to step out, before I could realize it, my foot slipped and I fell neck down onto the edge of my tub. Time seemed to slow down in my head. And I remember that my last thought was, wow, this is how I die? How stupid. But here's the thing. At the moment of impact, I woke up in a start back in my bed. I know it sounds stupid and cheesy like something from a dumb Netflix show, but there's literally no other way to describe what happened. I was lying in my bed right before I got up to shower the first time, but I don't remember falling asleep. And the thing is, I've been a lucid dreamer for the last five years or so. And if this was a dream, it was way more vivid than anything I have ever experienced. What really weirded me out, though, was that the exact same friend who texted me the first time messaged me after I woke up to tell me that the guy she'd had a crush on had asked another girl out and that she was really bummed out about it and didn't want to come to the party. I was weirded out that there was some similarity between that and the dream but I didn't think about it much at first. As I went to reply, my younger brother came in to ask if I would take him to his friend's house. All the blood drained from my face. He just stood in the doorway looking confused and asked me what was wrong. I rushed to the bathroom, feeling like I was losing my freaking mind, and I went to check the conditioner bottle. I know this sounds completely crazy, but the bottle was finished just like before and the grip mat was kicked up. At that point, I went back to lie down in bed and I texted my friends to tell them that I would not be going to the party. I'm pretty sure that I slipped in the shower, 
died, and then woke up in some alternate dimension. I know it sounds kind of crazy, but I really don't know how else to explain this series of events. In any case, it's rattled me ever since. At the time of this event, I was living in downtown Toronto, and I had just moved in with my new roommates. One guy was my buddy. The place I moved into used to be a shoe factory years ago, so the new place was great. I was chilling with my buddy and our other roommates. Joe and I made a joke about how this place must be haunted because of how old it is. Joe kind of brushed off what I was saying, though, and joked that if he told me stories, I would move out. Joe's been living there for like 20 years, so I don't doubt that he's seen some things. Before I get into the stories, I wanted to clarify that I'm not sure if I believe in ghosts. My attitude has always been that I can't really prove or disprove their existence, or of anything paranormal really. I've experienced quite a few strange encounters in my lifetime, but nothing to really sway my opinion that ghosts exist 100%. So it was a weekend night. I stayed up really late. It was like three or four in the morning, and I went out to the living area to get some water. As I was filling my water bottle, the whole time I was out there, I felt like something was drawing my attention toward the TV or couch area. The TV was always on. I don't know why. I feel like my roommates were just too lazy to turn it off. So I'm stumbling toward the couches and I could make out the shape of somebody's head from behind it. It was kind of this white transparent color. All I can remember is that as I got closer, there was this static from the TV. It kept getting louder, until the TV finally made a big pop noise. I ran back to my room. I just stood there in complete shock. I didn't move for like five minutes, just trying to comprehend what had happened. As I said before, I don't really believe in ghosts, but this scared me really badly. I've never felt an energy or something like that before. It's really hard to explain how I felt during that experience, but it gives me goosebumps just remembering it. The second story took place in the daytime. I was alone in the apartment, cooking some brunch. In the apartment, there was a section of walls that were covered in mirrors. Joe made kind of a makeshift gym in front of them. So I was doing my normal thing, just cooking, but the whole time I couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching me with a sharp glare. Like I said, the TV is always on. So when you're cooking in the kitchen, you can see in the mirrors the TV area reflected. As I'm cooking, this like glitter or flash of light would pierce the corner of my eye, like somebody was trying to get my attention. This happened about three times. I'm starting to get more freaked out because the whole vibe of the apartment just felt really negative, which was odd. As I'm finishing up, the door to my room just shuts. It had been like halfway open. When that happened, I just left the apartment to get some fresh air. I didn't even touch the food I had just got done cooking. What really doesn't make sense about this is that the doors we had in that place were really heavy. They had soundproofing on them, so when you went to close them, you really had to pull on them. Those were the two really big things I had happen while I was living there. When I was living there, I had a girlfriend that would stay over all the time. I never mentioned anything about ghosts to her. We never talked about ghosts either when I was living there. It wasn't until I had moved out and we were on a date that I brought it up to her. All I asked her is if she ever saw or felt anything strange while I was living there. What she told me was pretty shocking. She told me about how she would have nightmares every once in a while, 
where something would climb up to where we would sleep and attack her. The apartment had like eight meter ceilings, so the sleeping area was at the top. This freaked me out because one time I had had a dream that somebody climbed up there and grabbed my feet. I actually woke up from that dream screaming. She also explained that she felt like there were multiple spirits there, some good, some bad. She's way more spiritual than I am. So I had a hard time wrapping my head around what she had said. She said that she felt that there was a mix, like I said, good ones and also dark ones. Anyway, that was my experience living in this apartment that used to be a shoe factory. There were other instances of things happening, weird noises, doors closing, the normal. But these two events really stood out. I live in the mountains, and my hollow is surrounded by woods. There's a little spot you can walk into in the woods, which is just a giant circle with trees open all around it. My friend and I have gone to picnic there, and this day that we went there, we started hearing this flute. It was really loud, and it was coming from a direction where there were no houses. It sounded like a woodwind of sort something that sounded very spiritual. All of my neighbors were pretty old, and I can guarantee that none of them spend their time walking in the woods playing a flute. We heard this for hours. We left at about eight o'clock that night, and when we walked back, you could hear it somewhat across the valley. I didn't hear it again for about two years after that, but one night I woke up at three o'clock in the morning. My bed was right next to the window and I had cracked it to let in some fresh air while I slept. I woke up to the sound of the flute coming right outside my window. I was too worried to look out and see what it was. It went on for about an hour before it finally stopped playing. And to this day, I have never heard it again. I feel creeped out even typing this story. I'm staying at my friend's house in Tennessee over winter break, and tonight I helped her feed the neighbor's dogs because they were out of town. Her house is in a somewhat rural area. There are clusters of homes kind of spread across fields, forests, and lake areas, all very beautiful and full of lots of wildlife. It's about 9 p.m. and it's way past sunset. It's quite dark and we're walking the short distance from the neighbor's house back to hers. We are on a road, but directly next to us is a small wooded area sloping down to the lake. I'm a little nervous about it, so I make a joke like, that forest is kind of creeping me out. Imagine if there's a skinwalker out there. She laughed and gobbled like a turkey loudly into the forest. Jokingly, I said, don't do that, it'll attract one. Not five seconds later, we hear an identical gobble back to us from the forest. It was definitely not an echo. There was no light out there, no paths, and it was very cold, like 30 degrees. I can't imagine anybody would just be hanging out in the woods on the off chance they could mock somebody. What's weirder is that it sounded like her. It sounded as though somebody had recorded her voice and played it back. I just remember saying, oh my God, and then sprinting as fast as I could back to the house. I don't think I've ever run so fast or with so much intention in all my life. I didn't turn back and I was so out of breath it hurt. 
My friend thought the whole thing was funny, but I didn't. It was so freaky. Did we see or encounter a skinwalker? Or was it something else? It was 1983 to 85 when we had moved from Japan to the Florida Panhandle. Fort Walton Beach, to be exact. The most beautiful community you could imagine. Even though the ocean was only one side of the Panhandle, it felt like we were surrounded by water. There were myriad of ocean-fed lakes and tributaries fed by the Gulf of Mexico, weaving their way around the area. Anywhere in the town was about five minutes from the warm sands of a beach. Okaloosa Island was a quick drive, and the entire length of it was like Peter Pan's Pleasure Island, dotted with huge water slides and pina colada scented surf shops. The beaches there were lined with snow white sand that melted into the bluest waters you usually only saw in movies. I loved it there. The ocean air, the many low bridges linking different parts of the town over parts of the ocean, the perfect warm weather. I absolutely loved it. The house was almost enough to make me forget that, though. Almost. It wasn't a big house at all, not like the typical haunted houses they make movies about. It wasn't huge and full of dark rooms and basements. It was just the opposite. It was a small, one-floor house with two bedrooms, one of which I shared with my younger brother, one bathroom, a living room, and a kitchen. What we didn't have with money living a military lifestyle was made up for by traveling all over the place and experiencing life in a way most people never get to. So the house was small, but we were happy. It was also on a pretty major street that was fairly busy all day a stoplight only a block away from us. A very unassuming living situation. There was, however, one small detail my parents had kept from us until we were fully moved in. Across the street, there was an enormous brick wall that spanned at least 20 feet high, dressed in dripping green ivy and topped with ornate black iron spikes every 10 feet, the entire length of it that being at least five or six blocks. I had thought it was the private property of the wealthy. There were so many of them there. Old mansions owned by older money. They were everywhere. But that was not the case here. No, not at all. That monolithic wall housed not an antiquated home, but an antiquated cemetery, complete with archaic statuary wrought with vines and cracks and small mausoleums for the old money of the city. My brother and I were, of course, completely horrified. But the wall did its job and helped us to forget soon enough, and life continued. One night, we were all watching Night Flight together. I loved music and my parents, being very young for parents of two boys, were a huge influence on my love of rock and pop. Our couch sat in front of the huge living room window that looked out onto the busy street, only facing away from it. At this time of night, traffic was minimal, and any noise was being drowned out by the yes singing, owner of a lonely heart anyway. Still, I heard something over the music, something coming from the street. I instinctively looked over at my mom, and she just kind of shook her head no to me, like she knew what I was thinking. I turned around on the couch anyway, and pushed the curtain aside to see what it was. My mom did the same. I could see the stoplight clearly. The light was red, and there was a woman standing on the corner, looking panicked. A car had pulled up to her, and she started screaming bloody murder, struggling and yelling, while she was being pulled into the car. My mom just squeezed my shoulder. I pulled my head back in to see why my dad wasn't running out there to save her, but he was watching TV with my little brother, both completely unbothered. My brother was playing with some toy, 
clearly not hearing the screaming, and my dad was just sitting back tapping his foot to the song. I started to say something, but my mother's hand squeezed harder, and I whispered, But... And she said quietly, There's nothing to see. I looked back out the window. There was nothing. No car, no woman, nothing. It happened so fast. I was confused. Where did the car go? I didn't hear it peel out, and there wasn't enough time either. I didn't know when the screaming stopped either. It just stopped. I realized that when I was watching the car and the girl, there were no other cars driving by. In those few minutes, no one passed them. And now the street was suddenly very busy. I looked up at my mom, and she said under her breath, I told you not to look. And gave me this look that said, Don't tell your father you saw anything. So I didn't. That would be just the beginning of my experiences at that house. This story might be a bit long, but it's something that happened to me years ago, and I'm still very curious about what it could have been. When I was about 13, I was in a relationship with a girl that I visited pretty frequently, almost every day after school if I could. Due to me visiting her so often, I got to know her and her family, as well as her home. They were very kind people, but just a little off. At the time, I wasn't a very religious person. However, my girlfriend and her family were Satanists. When I first heard that, I thought it was a joke, but soon I realized that they were being serious. I wasn't too surprised or bothered by it. She later told me that the house was haunted, and me being the biggest skeptic kind of just brushed it off and showed interest so we could keep talking. After a while, I started to notice things in the house that were a little bit unsettling, but I was quick to dismiss them. I figured anything had a logical explanation behind it, so why try to claim that it was something paranormal? At first it started with small tapping sounds. To be honest, at this time, I thought it was just the house settling or creaking due to the wind. We live in Florida, so it wasn't too hard to believe that some weather could have caused the house to make noises. That's what I believed, since it was the most logical explanation. That was until we heard scratching coming from inside her closet. We thought it was her cat at first, especially because he would constantly bring her into the room and she liked to explore. We also thought maybe she had snuck in and we had closed the door on her, oblivious, and it took her until just that moment to try to get out. Obviously, we got up and opened the closet door, but nothing was there. This was very peculiar, but I shrugged it off and figured that maybe it was a mouse or a rat in the walls. She pointed out, though, that there were scratch marks all over the closet. They weren't high up. If anything, they were about level with a common cat or a small dog. But like I said, the cat wasn't in the closet. It wasn't even in the room. Needless to say, I was weirded out. I wasn't scared, but I was starting to believe that something wasn't right. I don't know exactly what was wrong, but I was starting to feel off after this. Weeks go by and even months go by. Some minor things keep happening. Mostly just the scratching, which has pretty much torn up the paint in the closet entirely at this point. But also other things like the cat acting strangely and a weird sense of unease when you're in certain parts of the house, particularly the restroom, the garage, and the master bedroom. I just assumed that it all had a rational explanation, of course. I wasn't sure of what it was, but I was stubborn and dumb. One day, though, something was especially creepy. So creepy, to me, in fact, that I had actually started to question whether or not there are such things as gods, demons, ghosts, etc. Something that will stick with me 
forever. One day, my girlfriend had invited me over, so I asked my mom and she dropped me off. I noticed that there weren't any cars in her driveway, which wasn't really weird since her family did work often or were out shopping a lot. My girlfriend opens the door after I knock and lets me in. First thing we did was head to her room to watch Third Rock from the Sun. While we're sitting in there, we make some small talk and go to the kitchen to grab some food. And then we go back to her room to keep watching TV. At some point though, hours later, we end up shutting off the TV and just start talking. Out of nowhere though, we hear her older sister yell her name from right outside her door. We assumed they were finally home from wherever they went and we went out there to check up on them. Weirdly enough though, we didn't see her. We checked everywhere around the house and didn't see her at all. We even yelled back but got no response. We chalked it up to us maybe hearing something else and just assuming that that's what we had heard instead. Like maybe there was a noise and we thought we heard her name. Like I said, stubborn and dumb. We head back to the bedroom and sit down but this time we leave her bedroom door open just in case her sister really did call for her and attempted to do it again. After a few moments, we hear her sister call for her name again. However, this time it didn't seem like it came from behind the door. It sounded as if the entire house had called her name. Not only was it so loud and so clear, but it didn't change its tone or pitch. It sounded like it was a repeated audio recording from the last time she had called for her. Once again, we quickly bolt up and search around the house as fast as possible. We thought if it was her sister trying to play some kind of prank, we would find her, but we didn't see her. We couldn't even trace where the sound had come from, so we checked in all the areas where somebody could easily hide. Being dumb, we once again said it was probably nothing to worry about. About an hour or so goes by and we hear her dad's truck start to pull up to the house. We check out the window to watch them and the rear passenger door opens. It's her sister. We were baffled to say the least and wondered when and how she had left so quickly. We met them at the door and asked her what it was that she had kept calling for and how she'd gotten out and ended up with her family. She looked at us with confusion and concern. What she and her dad told us makes me anxious to this very day. She said that she'd been gone since six in the morning doing some shopping. We immediately tried calling her bluff, but her dad doubled down and seemed to get a little bit annoyed by this and told us that they were indeed out shopping all day. Right after he told us this, we told her sister that we had heard something that sounded exactly like her voice calling for my girlfriend and we tried finding whatever it was, but we came up with nothing. Something about this must have really alerted and worried her sister, because after we told her this, she immediately went pale and looked sick. She told me that she would like to speak to my girlfriend in private real quick and brought her to the back porch. I went back to my girlfriend's room and just sat on her bed waiting for her to come back. After about five or 10 minutes, she came back and looked a little concerned while also downplaying what had just happened. I asked her if everything was all right. She said, yeah, she asked if we had gone into her room. I told her I did and she got mad. She told me though that if we ever hear her voice while she's not home to not go in her room. I guess right above her bed is an attic and she told me how one time she was sleeping, she'd woken up in the middle of the night and saw the attic right above her bed was cracked open and she saw her own face staring back at her from inside the attic. This story is entirely true and something that has stuck with me for years. I'm 24 now and though it's been a little over 10 years, it still feels like it happened yesterday.
Growing up in Jacksonville as a kid, I was living about a mile from a preserve and national park. Being that the area was known as a historic monument with Spanish forts and old naval bases, there were battles fought there, in which tons of Native Americans and Spanish died essentially in my backyard. Around the time of being six to eight years old, I had night terrors met with sleep paralysis events in which I would see a human-like shadow in my room. The latter only happened twice. During those two occasions, I remember seeing it emerge from the corner of my room. And during the first event, it just stayed in place. It had no remarkable features, with only the outlining of its body being a darker barrier that defined a human outline. Head, torso, legs, arms, and maybe hands. However, the second time this happened, I immediately had an elevated heart rate and I started panicking out of fear. Most likely, I had woken from a nightmare. I was positioned on my left side, with the shadowy guy facing my peripheral on the right, and this time it started walking toward me, getting in my bed, and holding me with its hand on my chest. From that, I was in a total panic attack, to the point that I could hear my blood pumping in my ears. After a while, I guess I just fell asleep, Maybe I passed out, I honestly don't remember. Even with all of that, I don't think I told my mom at the time. Though now I tell her about both of these experiences all the time. She kind of just says, well, maybe that did happen. Or maybe it was just a vivid nightmare. Nowadays, I look back on that with a sort of mystified perspective. Growing up, our household was really stressful for a child. There was a lot of parental fighting on a daily basis, especially with my dad being an alcoholic. He didn't abuse me, not physically, but all of that torment did lead to a divorce when I was about 13. I've never spoken with a therapist about this or anything, but I do feel like those events were likely a product of the stress, 